Hello, I'm Mark Skinner, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to our panel discussion on the ethics of plasma. Uh, we greatly appreciate the uh, Immune Deficiency Foundation for inviting us to participate in the conference today uh, on this important and, uh, and somewhat perennial topic uh, uh, for our community. Joining me today is uh, Johan Prevo, Peter Jarowski and Val Bias. Uh, each of the three, three individuals have a long history of engagement uh, with plasma, uh, as well as the, uh, the issues that we're going to discuss today. Uh, Johan has worked in the healthcare sector for over 20 years in the field of uh, patient advocacy and health policy. He currently serves as executive director of the International Patient Organization for Primary Immune Deficiencies, also known as IPOPI. And among his many board roles, he is a steering committee member of the Platform of Plasma Products Users uh, Plus, which is a European consortium of all of the patient organizations that have an interest in a dependency on plasma-derived therapeutics. Johan has previously worked as Director of Health Policy for the European Plasma Therapeutics Association, a trade association in the field of plasma protein therapies. Um, so as you can tell, Johan has a well-rounded and diverse background, uh, which will make him uh, uh, really helpful as we have the discussion today. Uh, uh, next, I'd like to introduce Peter. Uh, Peter teaches ethical values of business to undergraduates uh, and ethical leadership for MBA candidates and executive MBAs at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. He was a visiting research professor at Brown University. His academic work has been published in Ethics, Philosophical Studies, the Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence the Journal of Business Ethics, the Journal of Value Inquiry, Ethical Theory, and Moral Practice, among many others. He's written and spoken extensively about the ethics and economics of the global plasma industry. Peter, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And, uh, and third uh, on our panel, uh, a longtime and very close friend, Val Bias. Uh, he has 25 years of experience in orchestrating the interplay of grassroots, national, and federal legislative frameworks for patient care and has become known for his in-depth understanding of drug policy, drug development, and drug reimbursement. Val's efforts in advancing health initiatives, strategies, and action plans at the national level have established him as a capable political advocate, a national spokesperson, a skilled nonprofit business leader, and a change agent and consensus broker. Most recently, Val served as CEO of the National Hemophilia Foundation in the United States. And I should briefly introduce myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm Mark Skinner. Um, I have had the privilege of working in this space uh, with the colleagues that you see today for many years, having previously served as president of the World Federation of Hemophilia and before that, the National Hemophilia Foundation. Uh, and today I work uh, in the space of uh, patient outcomes and health outcomes uh, on a variety of global initiatives. Uh, so to kick it off today, um, I'd really just like to begin and uh, to hear a little bit from each of our uh, three panelists uh, about um, some of their backgrounds and experience and expertise and sort of to help us set the context of how they've been involved uh, in this space. Um, we're hoping today's conversation will be interactive. Uh, and so I encourage each of the panelists to jump in, interrupt, raise your hand, uh, or feel free to build on uh, any of the colleagues' comments. But for the next 45 minutes to hour, uh, we're gonna have a conversation uh, about what uh, are some of the hot issues that are deeply important to each of us as we seek access to the life-saving therapies on which our lives depend. So let's kick it off today and uh, invite Johan to talk a little bit about his background and what he sees uh, as the hot topics and what's going on in the space today. Uh, Johan? Thank you so much, Mark, and it's a pleasure to be uh, with, with all of you today. Um, so you've introduced me uh, pre pretty well already, uh, but perhaps uh, what I would say is that indeed I, my career started um, in, the, in the plasma industry. Um, I was responsible for health policy in Europe for the PPTA. So the PPTA is the trade association representing the private sector uh, plasma fractionators. And in that role, I, I worked um, with various stakeholders. I was in charge of, of working with um, 
transportation organization. So during that part of my career, I worked with several uh, patient communities, uh, the hemophilia community, the primary uh, immunodeficiency community, but also others, CIDP, uh, Guillain-Barre, alpha-1 antitrypsin. And I, I think I got a, a good understanding of the common challenges uh, that uh, brought these uh, different patient communities together when it comes to accessing uh, life-saving plasma products. And so, uh, you know, I guess that gave me a, a good background in the broader uh, issue surrounding access to these, uh, you know, very specific, uh, highly regulated uh, plasma-derived medicinal products. And then since 2010, I've been working with, um, with the International Patient Organization for Primary Immunodeficiency, IPOPI, uh, since 2011 in the capacity of executive director uh, of the organization. And um, as um, you know, immunoglobulin therapies are um, really driving the field of plasma-derived medicinal products today, obviously um, my, my 10 last years have been focused on ensuring we monitor very closely these developments when it comes to access and supply of, of immunoglobulin therapies and trying to get a better understanding of what are the main hurdles. Uh, we certainly have seen in the last um, decade some shortages, some supply tensions, um, uh, which have been felt stronger or, or less strong depending on the years. And obviously with the COVID-19 um, pandemic, some of these issues um, have come, come to the fourth once again. Uh, and we're making sure that we monitor um, you know, these issues closely and take positions uh, to represent the views of our, of our patient community. So I've been a little bit on both sides of, of the pond, I guess you could say, first working uh, in industry and then really working um, uh, for a patient advocacy group. And I'm, I'm very passionate uh, about the fact that um, uh, policy discussions relating to access to these life-saving therapies should really be patient-centered. Uh, I think patients should be at the, at the core of any discussions relating to uh, access to plasma products. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to be with you all today to discuss these issues. Thank you, Johan. And you touched on several of the subjects that we want to dig into a little bit deeper as we go forward. Certainly supply and access and the current climate of COVID uh, will be important themes. Um, Let's, uh, let's go next to Peter and have Peter share with us a little bit of his experience with his work in Canada and, uh, and some of his research and what brings him to this space. Yeah, thanks very much and thank you for having me. Um, so I do come at it from more of an academic background. I used to teach business ethics and ethics to undergraduate business students. Um, and I would cover the topic of financial in incentives and other kinds of incentives in the healthcare space. And so I would cover the issue of payment for plasma donations. Um, but it wasn't until one of my graduate students, Doug was his name, started a company called Hemios that was um, planning on paying people for bone marrow uh, donations through apheresis that I became very involved. Um, so he had this business idea. This is what he wanted to move forward with. Uh, and the Department of Health and Human Services in the United States, they proposed to change the rules to make his business model illegal. Uh, I helped put a letter together from ethicists and economists to try to uh, keep the Department of Health and Human Services from changing the rule. Uh, we submitted that letter. The letter was uh, in the end successful. Um, they withdrew this proposed change in the rules. Uh, but at that point, the investors had pulled out and Doug unfortunately had to, had to stop pursuing that particular company. Now, while I was doing research on that particular topic, I became aware of the fact that the province of Alberta in Canada was proposing to introduce a law that would ban payment for plasma donations in that province. I didn't become personally involved, but that's how I uh, started down the path of taking a stronger interest in this. Uh, I am a Canadian, as Mark pointed out, and this topic is and has been um, a very significant policy topic in my home country of Canada. Uh, I did become involved in 2018 when British Columbia considered banning um, 
payment for plasma donations. They did, in fact, pass that ban, uh, unfortunately. Um, I started writing publicly uh, and getting engaged a little bit more seriously back in 2018. Uh, there was a proposal to ban payment for plasma donations across the entire country of Canada through the Senate. Uh, we wrote a letter at that point. Um, the Senate decided not to move forward uh, with that. I hope our letter played some role in that decision. Um, of late and last year, I participated a lot in the province of Alberta when they decided to overturn, to repeal the ban on uh, payment for plasma donations. Now in the interim, my, um, um, my stepbrother, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law, they had triplets. Uh, they were premature triplets. Uh, one of them unfortunately did not uh, survive, but the other two did. Um, and during surgeries, uh, both of them needed plasma therapies. I, I also had the opportunity to speak with a lot of patient advocacy groups and a lot of patients themselves. Um, and so that, that just pulled me in a lot more. So that's where I am right now. And I continue to do research in this space as well. And I consider it very meaningful and important research. And that's, so I've been involved for many years now. That's, that's me. Uh, well, thank you, Peter, for your good work, and I, uh, I think I'm fairly confident in saying there's a lot of patients uh, and families whose lives have benefited from your advocacy, so uh, thank you. Uh, and so uh, next I'd like to turn uh, to Val Bias. Uh, Val, you obviously have a long personal deep history uh, with, uh, with plasma, plasma therapies uh, from your uh, decades of work in, uh, in the world of hemophilia. Perhaps you can share a little bit uh, about your background and thoughts. Yes, my uh, uh, journey uh, as a patient uh, was my introduction to plasma as a child. Um, having hemophilia when I was born, there really wasn't uh, a treatment other than whole blood. And the uh, development of plasma therapy for hemophilia was a real breakthrough, at least it was for me, uh, in terms of treatment. Um, as I became an adult and uh, was exposed to uh, HIV and hepatitis C, uh, I became more aware of the plasma industry and um, the manufacturing process as well as the collection process and began to examine some of the flaws or inconsistencies um, in all of those areas. Um, at least uh, for the bleeding disorders community as plasma was uh, collected, there was an issue where the plas plasma centers um, were housed in terms of uh, getting the plasma from transient people. Uh, we later learned that they were getting plasma from prison populations uh, and just a wide variety of populations that it was difficult to screen. Certainly, we didn't have the testing available to ensure that the uh, collected plasma was safe. Uh, those things have been corrected, but right down to the questionnaire when you come into the center, uh, what they're asking you and what kind of uh, investigation based on your answers that you would get. The system has been shored up in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I would say probably, although I know this personally, I knew it when I was uh, CEO of uh, NHF, um, you know, 70 to 80% um, uh, really um, sound. Um, the national system uh, records the people who make their donations if they don't come back for the second donation, the plasma isn't used. Um, we, certainly we have better testing for the plasma than we ever have had before. And the industry has worked positively toward moving those centers to sort of um, uh, uh, cities and areas where you're getting donations from um, working class families and um, uh, university students so that the likelihood of you getting um, a contaminated uh, donation is less. Uh, having visited some of these centers, it's <laughs> really a remarkable change uh, in terms of it's more like a community center than it is a plasma collection center where there's uh, uh, child care available for patients who come in to donate their plasma, where they uh, really work to have 
regular donations from the same people where there's some connectivity between the patients who are donating uh, from the individuals who are donating the plasma, uh, creating a real community. And that's not happening everywhere, but there's been a real effort um, to develop those kinds of uh, centers. So the industry has changed a lot. Um, what um, I advocated for was certainly um, the patient organization banding together to influence the policies of the com companies as well as uh, any policies that might go before uh, the government agencies or Congress uh, in terms of plasma collection or plasma distribution. Um, I strongly believe that those efforts have to be led by patient organizations. Um, and uh, in the United States, we've been successful at that. Um, I haven't always been pleased that the congregation of those patient groups is hosted by the industry. I think that you know, makes their decision suspect, even though I don't think industry has a lot of um, um, influence over those, but there's certainly a deference if they're hosting the meeting. Um, so uh, I strongly advocate for independence in that area. And I actually, as I think about it now, now uh, the industry should really be um, to some degree funding those patient organizations because our advocacy as a group has a larger impact um, on um, the government than they might. Um, the government often sees them as profit seekers, whereas the patients have their own interest um, uh, in mind. So uh, still some work to be done there, but largely um, I would say I'd give us an A for effort. Uh, and thanks, Val. So what I think was somewhat remarkable from the conversations that we just heard uh, is that the, the issue today is not the safety of plasma-derived medicinal products, that the products have come a very long way, and the, the safety, the regulatory oversight, and the confidence of those of us that depend on them has improved dramatically since the, uh, the 80s and the 90s, the period that Val talked about. But it sounds like the issue uh, that everybody has talked about really is uh, supply and access. Um, what does it mean for patients today? Do we have enough product? Uh, do we really need to compensate people? Uh, what's, what's wrong with, uh, uh, with uh, just uh, routine blood donation that we read about in the paper uh, every day? So I'm wondering if, uh, again, Johan, maybe we'll come back to you because I do know it's, you know, it's quite a hot topic in Europe these days is you know, actually helping policymakers understand the difference between blood and plasma. It, it may seem like a fine point to the, to the general public, but obviously it's fundamentally important to us that, that blood and plasma, um, while plasma comes from blood, uh, are certainly uh, distinct uh, uh, products. Uh, so could you help us put a little bit of context of uh, what's going on in Europe and, and why this distinction is important and maybe educate uh, our audience a little bit? Oh, sure, Mark. And I think you, you, uh, you highlight that very uh, important point about supply uh, you know, being the main issue nowadays. One of the uh, key statements that uh, me and my colleagues from the uh, platform of, of uh, Plasma Protein Users Plus have been making in the last few years uh, is that supply has really become the main safety uh, issue. Uh, that is to say, if there's not enough supply, uh, this is what will threaten patient safety at the end of the day. So making sure uh, we can access uh, sufficient quantities of these products uh, is, is highly important. The, the issue of, of the, 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 the need for um, a better recognition uh, of the differences between blood products and, and plasma products is, is a key issue uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, it's something on which we work uh, constantly. I think, you know, the, the, the first aspect, obviously, to uh, bear in mind uh, is almost a mathematical um, aspect, which is that um, people just can't donate blood as often as they can donate plasma. Um, generally speaking, people will donate blood um, between four uh, and six times per year. Um, and um, this is because blood doesn't regenerate uh, in the human body um, so fast. And um, typically from a blood donation, you will recover uh, probably about 250 milliliters of, of plasma. 
uh, for fractionation. If we look at plasma donation, uh, first, the, the, the first thing to bear in mind is that plasma does re uh, uh, regenerate much quicker uh, in the human body within 48 hours. Um, and um, when plasma donors uh, donate plasma, they can donate uh, much larger quantities or so typically uh, around 800 milliliters uh, of plasma can be, can be donated. So if you look at you know, how much plasma you can recover from blood donations versus how much plasma uh, you're getting from plasma donations, it's not difficult to understand that unless you would have a significant increase of uh, the blood donors base on a worldwide basis, you, you won't be able um, to collect sufficient quantities of plasma. So one of the key messages we, we've had in Europe, I think it's, it's, it's very important when we talk about these issues to recognize differences um, of approaches uh, between different countries. Um, we certainly support the, 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 uh, both, both blood and plasma donors. So that's already a, a key message that I want to make sure we, uh, we highlight today is that absolutely we support both blood and plasma donors. What we're saying is that right now, the majority um, of plasma collected worldwide does come from plasma donors. It comes from source plasma donors. And until now, there hasn't been any um, uh, strategy um, to, to, to change the equation. And I think um, at the end of the day, it's all about making sure we can access safe and effective uh, plasma products when it, comes, when it comes to the patient. The other thing to bear in mind is that, um, you know, we talk about bl blood and plasma, but sometimes uh, it goes even uh, beyond that. You know, in, in Europe, we, we have also uh, discussed these issues in the context of the broader organ donation or tissues and cells donation, any part of the human body uh, that is being donated. So I think they are, again, an important difference is to remember plasma regenerates in the human body uh, pretty rapidly. And the usage uh, that is made of plasma products is also very different. So again, if we look at blood, uh, labile blood products for transfusion um, you know, are always or almost always used locally. I mean, uh, uh, there's no global use for these uh, types of products. They have shorter uh, shelf lives and so forth. Plasma products are finished pharmaceutical products uh, that circulate between, between world regions. So that's another very important difference uh, to bear in mind when we talk about, uh, about the two um, types of, of collection and the two types of products. And making sure that in future uh, legislation uh, in the European Union, these differences are better recognized, notably with better definitions, I think will contribute in clarifying um, the role of, of, of the two types of, of treatments, if you will, and outline um, the fact that plasma products are, at the end of the day, global resources. And I'm sure we'll touch upon that more when we talk about COVID-19. But uh, that's probably what I, I can say as a, an introduction to the issue. And thank you, Johan. I think one of the key message points that you just mentioned is the, uh, is the notion that blood is local and plasma is global. And, and quite simply, that uh, is, is at the crux of the issue in meeting demand. But uh, before I go to, to Peter, just a, just a couple of facts that I think people may or may not be aware of. Uh, so based on estimates of uh, PPTA, the, uh, the Plasma Protein Therapeutics uh, Association, the Trade Association of Manufacturers, as they look at uh, the supply chain for the raw materials that go into making the products, uh, that's the plasma donations in particular, uh, they have estimated that it takes uh, 130 plasma donations to treat uh, an individual with primary immune deficiency for a year. 900 to treat someone with alpha-1 antitrypsin a year, and over 1,200 to treat someone with hemophilia A. That's an enormous number of donations when you consider the alternatives of one or two liters of blood that would be used to create a, a routine emergency or surgery that would require blood donation. So we begin to get a sense of the scale and the scope of what's needed really to treat uh, our growing population and particularly as new indications and therapies are identified. 
Um, and just one last little fact is well over 60% of the plasma collected worldwide that goes into the production of plasma derived medicinal products uh, actually comes from the United States. So while the supply is robust uh, and there are large systems, it is indeed fragile uh, if something would occur uh, within the US that would disrupt this uh, supply chain of raw materials, which I think leads us to the critical issue uh, that Canada has faced uh, and in a number of other countries. But since Peter's with us today, uh, Peter, perhaps you could comment on uh, what it means for supply, sort of the duality of having a blood collection and a plasma system, uh, and, uh, and the ability to meet uh, both local and contribute to global needs. Yeah, I think uh, both you and Johan touched on most important issues there. Um, just to give you a little bit of the story in Canada to sort of highlight and emphasize the, the demand side, just how much volume of plasma we need compared to blood and plasma for transfusion. So in Canada in 2019, we needed 1.6 million liters of plasma just to meet the needs of the patients who, relied, uh, who rely on plasma therapies. 1.6 million liters. If you look at how much blood and plasma Canada collected for all of the purposes that blood and plasma are used for in 2019, we had somewhere on the order of 800,000 donations, right? I don't think people, at least the people I speak to, understand just how much we need um, when it comes to plasma alone. You mentioned that the United States provides approximately 60% of the global plasma supply. If you add Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Czech Republic to that total, you get 89%. 89% of all of the plasma used around the world in order to manufacture plasma-derived medicinal therapies comes from 5% of the world's population. 5% provides nine-tenths of the plasma used to make plasma therapies. That is, I mean, we're asking too much of too few, and we really do need to see more countries begin to take the collection of plasma more seriously, right? Um, a couple of other points about the, um, the fact that too many people conflate blood and plasma donation. I think, I think an additional concern has to do with safety. People don't understand, as you pointed out, Johan, that you can, uh, and you pointed it out as well, Mark, you can donate plasma safely much more often than you can donate blood. Uh, it's also true that the plasma that is used to make the therapies goes through additional safety steps that we sometimes cannot use on labile products. Um, I think the fact that people misunderstand this, they, they misunderstand the nature of this industry, they misunderstand um, how it works. And I think that contributes to uh, some of the I mean, in my judgment, I would just say bad policies that many countries and many governments have adopted with respect to plasma collection. Yeah, so I think, I think that's basically, I mean, I just wanted to emphasize how much volume we need and we're nowhere near. And we are seeing decreases in plasma collection in the United States. And I worry as a result of the pandemic and I worry about what that means for patient communities. I'm in touch with the patient communities in Canada and while Canadian Blood Services assures the patients there that their supply of immunoglobulin is um, stable, uh, I am concerned that um, that might not be true you know, going forward into the future, yeah. yeah and so, so Val, we've talked about the um, the history in the hemophilia community and one of the other um, great advantages I didn't mention earlier, I also live with severe hemophilia uh, like Val, is that we are fortunate today that we have a range of treatment options available, which did not exist uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, when you and I started uh, our journey. Uh, but I think it perhaps is important to put some perspective on you know, our community is, is much wider and that plasma products, uh, I, uh, I perceive, are still important to our community um, in the U.S. and perhaps uh, globally. Can you share any thoughts about sort of what the role of 
plasma therapies and why they continue to be important? Um, plasma therapies uh, are important, uh, I think, uh, for our patients as um, a matter of choice. There are some um, clotting factor deficiencies that clot plasma is their only choice uh, for treatment. Um, and um, I believe that, um, you know, some patients are just more comfortable uh, with plasma than the newly developed products. But as Mark said, we have a variety of products to choose from, uh, just not as many for our, the rarer disorders, uh, bleeding disorders within our community spectrum. Um, we've remain, maintained a strong position to, to support all of the patients uh, who are dependent on plasma products. Uh, I think we've done that out of kinship um, for the way the products are made uh, in terms of manufacturers who, you know, you, you don't profit from just making the hemophilia profit uh, product. You, you need to make the um, um, immune globulin as well as the alpha one product. Um, so that uh, we've always remained a, a strong supporter of their access. Um, one of the things I always think of as unfair in terms of um, how these things play out in a menu and as well a marketing issue for the market here is that uh, we do face shortages in immune globulin that I don't think we should face. I think there was an opportunity uh, early on in the 80s and uh, 90s to secure that population's um, uh, supply. And we didn't do that um, as well as alpha one. Uh, we discussed that, but we didn't really get it done. Um, and that contributes to any shortages for those populations. And I think as we look forward to other uses uh, for plasma products, um, that affects the market. And the industry is going to shape itself to, uh, to supply all comers. And you don't want them setting the priority list uh, of patients who are currently on products or patients who may be coming on products. Therefore, you have to collect more plasma. Uh, I think that that comes in, in two roles. Um, one is uh, educating policymakers about the plasma industry and how the collection process and the manufacturing process works. Uh, I did that in the bleeding disorders community who had a real lack of understanding as they moved into this new area of products that we have available to them. So we started working with one of the companies to um, have tours. They had tours of their manufacturing plant, plant and we encouraged the patient um, chapter organizations to go to those plants and take that tour so they could see how plasma was collected, so they could see how it was manufactured. Uh, and that was a way of educating uh, them about the process. I think that that same kind of uh, program needs to be implemented for policymakers so they understand more about how those products are, are developed. I think for the general population in the United States, I think the incentives really are building community around giving plasma, that you're giving back to your own community, that you're doing something worthwhile. People are motivated uh, by contributing back to their community. It's an easy way um, to contribute back to their community without reaching into their own pocketbooks to do it. Um, and uh, so there are a couple of different approaches to you know, how you increase the supply and how you educate uh, policymakers about uh, the safety of plasma and the collection process. I think you've touched on several important points there, and certainly one of them is the sense of uh, community and family, that as a group of patient populations dependent on plasma disorders, excuse me, plasma protein therapies, uh, we really have developed a strong alliance and collaboration. Uh, and Val and I both have certainly been lucky to be born and grow up in the United States where we've had a range of options. We've had our shortages and certainly we've had challenges with the products, but uh, in the end, we're fortunate that we've had treatment. Uh, and although plasma therapies may not be as important for a hemophilia A person today as they were, they remain important for our sisters and brothers. And just in the interest of sort of sharing more facts, um, 85% of the plasma protein therapies um, that are made for uh, 
excuse me, of the, uh, of the treatments for hemophilia are consumed by about 15% of the world's population. So those of us that live in West Europe and North America really consume the vast amount. There just simply is not enough product to treat the world population. The 25% that have uh, reasonable access, um, you know, the vast majority of the world is, is unmet. So when we think about supply, we can't think about just what Canada needs, just what the US needs, or just what West Europe needs. We really need to think globally. And that brings me back to Johan, because certainly in the time of COVID, uh, you know, it's been exacerbated. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what some of the unique challenges were, particularly related to plasma therapies, both to maintain access, but also putting your global hat on with IPOPI, uh, what it's meant for, uh, uh, for patients and families around the world. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think it was a very, um, you know, uh, challenging period, but, but, but at the same time, I think some of the challenges uh, we face during COVID-19 are, are certainly opportunities to drive change in how we think, um, you know, about accessing uh, plasma products. The, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, usually, you know, if you, if you look at a, a major, um, you know, pu public health crisis, um, even if you go back to you know something like 9/11, this is usually periods in time where you see uh, the community coming together to donate. You know the, you have an increase in donation in this sort of situation. Here, for the first time in history, we've been faced with the opposite situation. You, you've had a decrease of donations because of the social distancing uh, measures and movement restriction measures. Um, you know, in force, in force of, of, of different countries. So, um, and at the same time, um, we, we started uh, talking about the role of, of plasma and plasma proteins more. Uh, firstly, uh, directly linked to uh, uh, treating COVID-19 with uh, discussions around convalescent plasma and uh, hyperimmune globulins for, for COVID-19. And uh, even if, um, if probably these discussions have no uh, lost a little bit um, of relevance in the sense that we've heard a recent uh, announcement that the, uh, the, the main clinical trial uh, looking at hyperimmune did not uh, hold its, its promises and seems to not have met its uh, main clinical endpoints. I think the advantage is had is that suddenly it seemed to me that decision makers, uh, you know, including in this region of the world in, in, in Europe, um, seem to be really genuinely concerned that, hey, if this is a treatment that can help save millions of lives, millions of people, adults and children, potentially um, affected by this awful virus, COVID-19, we need to like pull our efforts. We need to make sure that such treatments can reach the patient. And what struck me uh, during this discussion is that suddenly uh, there was a recognition that uh, plasma products were global resources. That um, if that uh, potential uh, uh, therapeutic um, role would have been confirmed, the aim uh, of, our, of, our, of our world would have been to work together to make sure that patients can, can access these therapies. And that's very, um, that's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting when um, you live in Europe and you're a patient advocate uh, in Europe that um, you know, for many years um, has been saying that ultimately plasma products should be viewed as global resources. That yes, more efforts should be made in each region to collect more. I mean, you've rightly pointed out about the fact that you know, the US and a handful of other uh, European countries collect the majority of, of plasma for fractionation worldwide, but we should not do so um, with a view to isolate ourselves from, from the other regions, but with a view to contribute to a global uh, sufficiency concept. And so we've been talking and we had been talking prior to COVID-19 already, about this new, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, this new expression, which is really global sufficiency based on more regionally balanced plasma collection. I think that encapsulates the, the, the vision of patients is that 
ultimately, especially if we look at immunoglobulin uh, replacement therapies, we know, and, 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 and you know, the, the patient advo advocacy groups, including obviously IDF uh, in the US and all our experts know that a different uh, patients living with primary immunodeficiency will, um, will tolerate different uh, brands of immunoglobulin therapies differently. Uh, lifestyle, um, you know, choices will also um, have an influence in which treatment might be more suitable for a particular uh, patients. Uh, venous access may uh, play a part. There's a myriad of different elements um, that make us strongly believe that the approach to treatments with immunoglobulin therapies, certainly in the case of the PID patient community, should be looked upon as um, individualized treatment. We should really approach that as individualized uh, treatment. And, and that is another argument in favor of making sure um, that plasma products can, can travel the world and can access patients uh, wherever patients need them. And so I think the COVID-19 um, you know, pandemic, as I hope, has, I hope, you know, help people understand that, uh, you know, plasma is global, plasma products are, are global life-saving resources and, and, and they need to be able uh, to circulate freely. And I don't think we can apply geographical restrictions uh, to their use. And, and, and you know, this, it, there's a rich history in Europe. I mean, a few years ago, we were still talking about national self-sufficiency uh, as a concept when it comes to, to plasma products. And, we all know what happened in the UK with the VCJD, you know, crisis in the 1990s. And I think that was a first sort of warning sign that you can't really approach uh, plasma products in the same way you would approach blood products. You know, it's not about a national supply. It's about contributing to the world supply. And, and obviously, each country needs to take decisions to ensure patients can access them. But ultimately, the world will be a much better place if there's more balance in how plasma is, is collected between regions and if products can circulate freely between regions. I mean, we talked about the US and you know, what, what happens if um, the US um, supply from one day to the next, like it happened in the UK in, in the 1990s is not, no longer usable. I mean, it's not only bad for Europeans. I mean, it's, it's mainly bad for American patients that happens and I think you know, just from a, a very theoretical uh, point of view, it just makes sense for these pharmaceutical products to be viewed as global treatments that, that should circulate freely. And so I think, I think that the COVID-19 crisis um, certainly helped us as patient advocates illustrate that need uh, maybe a bit more concrete. Um, so thanks, Johan. I think you and Val both touched on um, several important points that uh, it's there, there is a need for individualized patient-centered care to make sure individual patients get the right product, not only what they need therapeutically, but for whatever reasons, they make choices and decisions about the therapy they want to use. Uh, and that really then lends itself to the need for uh, great diversity and continuity of supply. I think this brings us back to, back to Peter, which sort of is where the conversation started is, you know, one of the you know, one of the big debates and perhaps maybe stigmas or confusions is, you know, why should we compensate for plasma? Is it unethical? Is it ethical to, to compensate? Um, is it necessary to meet this global need? So, so Peter, based on, on your research, any thoughts about the, you know, the ethics, the necessity of uh, compensating uh, payment to donors uh, for plasma, perhaps in juxtaposition to the, uh, the blood uh, community. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you know, let's begin with the central point of both a blood and plasma collection system. It is to ensure that we have enough product to meet the needs of the patients that rely on those products. It is not to give people an opportunity to behave altruistically. It is not to give people an opportunity to express their altruism. One of the things, when I discuss the ethics of paying people for plasma donations, one of the things that people raise is the worry that, you know, people should 
be doing this altruistically out of the kindness of their hearts and not out of a regard for the thickness or the size of their wallet, right? And I say, first of all, that's not, okay, that's great, but that is not the point of this plasma collection system. It's not the point of the blood collection system. Second of all, it turns out that everyone who collects the plasma, everyone surrounding the donor is paid for what they do, right? We don't think that nurses should be volunteers. We don't think that doctors should be volunteers. We don't think that phlebotomists should be volunteers, but we do insist that the donor be a volunteer. Now we think when it comes to nurses, phlebotomists, doctors, and so on, we think that it is possible for them to both be paid for what they do and to do it out of the kindness of their hearts and to be altruistic, right? For some reason, we don't think that's possible when it comes to plasma donors. Now, my own research, I've surveyed 75,000 plasma donors and blood donors in the United States. And the vast majority of both people who are paid for plasma, as well as people who give blood without payment, the vast overwhelming majority of them say that part of the reason why they give either plasma or blood is a result of wanting to help others. They recognize that this is something that helps patients. It is possible that the payment gets people in the door in the first place, but once you're in there, you get a chance to find out what your plasma is being used for. Uh, you get to sometimes see the stories of the patients that rely on that plasma. And I think people keep coming back to give plasma, at least a significant size of the people who give plasma, I think they go back precisely because they also feel good about what it is that they are doing. There are other ethical issues with respect to compensation for plasma donation, including the concern about exploitation, for example. That concern, there are many different theories of exploitation, but the most popular ones are that there be a fair distribution of the benefits from trade. And I think a, a lot of people don't understand that the amount of money that the donor receives in payment for their plasma is a significant percentage of the total revenue per liter of plasma. I don't really, it's a very complicated process as everybody knows. And so when we look at the cost of the final product, that's not really the price that we should be looking at when we're looking at whether or not the division is fair. Uh, during this pandemic, the price point has increased significantly for donors in the United States. And so I don't think at this point there's any question that the distribution of the benefits are in fact fair, but they were fair even before the pandemic. Like, maybe we want to break this down as like the percentage of the total revenue per liter of plasma. We can also break it down by the amount of time and effort involved in giving Plasma. And in the United States, it's more than $15 per hour. In Canada, it's more than $15 per hour. Everywhere, it's more than $15 per hour. Let me just circle back to the central point that I want to make here, uh, which is that the very point of this system is to make sure that we have enough for the patients who need it. That's the point, right? This worry, this concern that people should be doing it for this reason rather than that reason, that might be a secondary concern but the primary concern has to be to get enough for the patient. It has to be, as Johan pointed out, patient-centric and patient-oriented. Now, it turns out that paying people for plasma donations is effective. And every other system that we have tried so far is less effective, right? I mean, New Zealand was the last country in the world back in 2015 to be able to collect enough plasma to meet all of the needs of their patient population. But that was, as I said, in 2015. Since then, they have relied on the global plasma supply. They have relied on plasma collective primarily in the United States. We have more than enough evidence to conclude that payment for plasma donation is effective. And all the other systems that we have tried are not effective. And so for that reason, more countries should move in the direction of permitting and allowing payment. Um, 
thank you. I think that I think that was eloquent. Uh, the patient centeredness is uh, is really at the core of everything that we talk about. It's it's not a disdain for the blood community. It's not a desire that plasma trump blood, but it is that we we need to stay patient focused and develop a system that produces a safe product uh, on which we can rely, not only rely on safety but rely on continuity of access. Um, can I add, Mark, if I may yeah, please. add one other thing? Uh, so people have expressed the concern that payment for plasma reduces the amount of blood that is donated in a jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. I've been looking at this issue for at least the last four years, and I have found no evidence that that is true. In fact, I have a paper that is available publicly. I can make it available for people. People can look it up that looks at the introduction of paid plasma opportunities in Canada and the United States. And we found that that introduction was not associated with a reduction in blood donations in the cities where those centers opened. Instead, what we saw is either the same level of blood collections or in fact, a slight increase in blood donations after the paid plasma centers opened in those jurisdictions. We also have a data set across the United States that looks at parallel operations of plasma collections compared with blood donation centers. And there again, we see the same result, no impact on blood donations. I think that's important because if there was a negative impact, then there is a conversation that we could have about being smart about where we locate these centers and how to make sure we meet all of the needs. But I have found no evidence for that. And uh, so I conclude we should just go ahead and be more open to these centers. So if I could draw a conclusion from what you and Johanna both said, there, are, there really are two opportunities that there are still a small percentage of donors in those countries that uh, where compensation exists that actually donate. So there's enormous potential to grow there, but also uh, as Johan talks about sort of regional sufficiency and, and meeting global demand, there are opportunities for other countries to, to move forward and contribute to the, uh, to the global supply. Um, so Johan or Val, any thoughts on um, sort of, uh, what Peter has shared with us, um, particularly? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, the last point is very important. I mean, in Europe, we talk about the crowd in notes um, uh, effect. This is all we, 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 we describe what the Peter was talking about. And, and that's the fear indeed that if you start compensating uh, donors, donate their plasma, the blood donors, uh, uh, you know, number in these uh, countries will, will decrease. Certainly from what we've seen um, in those a few European member states, uh, which have um, essentially promoted the coexistence of both uh, the voluntary and paid blood donation um, system and the compensated plasma donation system, uh, we don't see any evidence of, of that crowding out. And so I think it's, it's very important in this discussion because unfortunately too often uh, what we see in Europe is that um, you know, the discussion go immediately into uh, complex um, um, you know, uh, polit politicized ethical discussions instead of really looking at the facts and figures, the fact that it does not um, you know, impact negatively um, on the blood donations. And I think unfortunately we also uh, evolve in an environment where when you're saying like we are that um, you know patients and, 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 and we say very generally um, you know support the coexistence of both sectors absolutely support both sectors and, and, and recognize the value and, and you know of, of both blood and plasma donors often that gets interpreted as you just against voluntary and paid blood, blood donation and, and this is not the case at all. Uh, uh, the matter of the fact is that what patients are saying is, you know, our main safety issue is supply. Most of the supply of these products come from compensated plasma donations. I, I mean, personally, uh, I wouldn't be bothered at all if, um, you know, there was enough plasma coming from voluntary and paid blood donors to cover all the needs of all patients in need. It, the reality is that's not happening. Um, it's not going to happen anytime soon. There hasn't been, despite all these discussions we've had in Europe, there hasn't been any increase 
um, in the plasma coll uh, collection coming from voluntary and blood donors. Instead, uh, the increase has been coming from compensated plasma donors. So what the patients are really saying, when you talk about ethics, make sure you remember why people are donating in the first place. And I come back to what Peter said, it's really putting the patient's interest at the core of these types of discussions. And, you know, this is what we're trying to do with PLUS. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're making progress um, in, in, in Europe. I think we, we've talked a lot about Europe and, and, and the US, but obviously there's lots of other uh, you know, regions where um, a change needs to happen as well in terms of, of plasma collections, although they have the, the challenges may be also very different and, you know, bringing the industry to GMP level, making sure you can, you know, collect um, and, and, and produce in a, in a safe um, and effective manner. Uh, but obviously, again, if you look at a region like Asia, about 60% of the world population, uh, you know, living in Asia and they're accessing you know, a small percentage of, of, of plasma products. And so that shows again, the need for that more balanced uh, approach to plasma collection. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, you know, each region is at a, a different, a different stages of where they are with these discussions and their infrastructure. But I think if everybody and if decision makers start to, you know, internationally recognize the fact we're talking about something that should be approach as a global resource, I think that would be a tremendous step forward uh, in making sure we advance these, these discussions and, and making sure we do, we do so for the good of patients. You know? Thank you, Johan. I, I think part of also what you're highlighting is that plasma protein therapy production is a complex process. It takes seven to nine months from the time a donor donates until a product is available to go in my vein uh, on the other end. Uh, when you look at the labile components, the fresh components, you know, they, they have a shelf life of, uh, of days or maybe a couple weeks. Uh, and so you can, you can dial up or, or dial down, but, but there is a strong need for a consistent, stable system that can meet that supply and ever-growing supply. Um, <clears throat> Val, uh, your thoughts, and also in particular, sort of, you've heard the issues in Europe and in Canada, sort of... Uh, the duality of the systems in the U.S. I'd be curious uh, about our the peaceful coexistence, perhaps, that exists in the U.S. Well, I do agree that uh, the focus should be on getting patients the products they need. But I'm I'm an advocate largely, and uh, my job is to get people motivated um, to do this or that. So um, I see one opportunity, a couple of things here um, in the United States, a lot of uh, uh, whole blood collection is motivated by employers who do a blood drive every year. We hear it all the time that some employees feel forced to do the blood drive. <laughs> okay. Now, however egregious that might be, we still get the blood. So there's an upside to that. The other thing that, um, at least uh, now that we're dealing with COVID-19 and there are vaccines available, I would wonder about, uh, piggybacking on that as the United States and other countries begin to share their supply, that you might embed a plasma message in that so that you're starting to get plasma from countries that you've never gotten it from before because you're giving them the vaccine and you're uh, putting a message in that plasma also helps with COVID-19. So that may increase the numbers in places that we've never had donations from before. Um, so it's just an opportunity that I encourage you all to think about. Um, but in the United States, I mean, further building on employers, literally encouraging their employees to donate, um, coupled with um, the paid plasma process um, may increase, but certainly will maintain the supply that's there now. Before I ask each of you to... Um... Uh, to sort of make a closing comment and make any comments on emerging issues or topics that perhaps we've not touched on in the final couple minutes that we have. I think it is worth noting that we've, we've talked about the important need of plasma protein therapies for those of us that live with lifelong chronic diseases for which our very survival uh, is to have access to the therapy. But it's also important to recognize that plasma pay, plays an enormous use in medicine and in surgery 
every day. And this industry is important for producing uh, vaccines um, in surgery and treating liver and organ transplants <clears throat> in a variety of other cardiopulmonary issues. Uh, and it, it's important that we have a robust industry to meet all the other conditions uh, of, of life that really cannot be met um, upon the existing system. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's just go around the, uh, the room again. And I'd just like some sort of closing comments, sort of key issues, key takeaway, you know, what you would like to share and have folks remember from our conversation today. So uh, <clears throat> again, uh, starting with Johan, uh, any uh, sort of closing thoughts or uh, words to leave with the audience? Well, I think you, you've highlighted rightly so the, the broader role of the industry. Um, I mean, if you remember how it all started, it started during World War II uh, with um, a doctor called Edwin Kern uh, in, in the US who, uh, you know, uh, managed to isolate albumin from human plasma. And albumin saved hundreds of thousands of soldiers' lives during World War II. I mean, that was um, you know, a total game changer from the previous World War. And this is how, uh, you know, the whole field started. Um, so I think there is a, a definite broader role. Uh, it's a very interesting history to, to, to look at, uh, you know, from the early days with albumin, uh, which was, you know, the main product driving uh, the whole field to then, um, you know, the emergence of um, uh, immunoglobulins, but, but obviously also coagulation factors, which for uh, a long time was a driving, uh, you know, uh, were the driving products of, of the industry. And then uh, in more recent times, immunoglobulins has become, has become the, the, the driver. And I think looking at the future, I'm always very interested about, you know, uh, people's perspective of how uh, we see uh, things uh, evolve, certainly in terms of uh, you know, immunoglobulin demand, it's been uh, increasing uh, on about six to eight percent per year um, in the last uh, few years. Uh, you know, when you look at projections, um, it seems that that growth, uh, uh, you know, will continue. And I think, you know, from the, per, you know, from, from our, our perspective and the, uh, and, and the primary immunodeficiency community perspective, we know that a large majority of, of PID patients around the world um, are not diagnosed and they're not accessing uh, the treatments that they need. And we know this to be a significant number, you know, around 80% of PID patients uh, uh, don't have access to the treatments they need. We also see uh, more and more the emergence of um, uh, immunoglobulin ther uh, therapy use in secondary immunodeficiency. And this is also something that's going to uh, continue to drive demand. Perhaps where we see, um, you know, a, 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 a different scenario, but I, I think that's for, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the patient communities where uh, uh, immunoglobulin therapies are used for their uh, immunomodulatory uh, uh, properties uh, to say, uh, but certainly we've seen for these, uh, immunomodulatory indications, uh, some alternatives uh, in the horizon, uh, like uh, FC receptor uh, inhibitors that may then, um, you know, impede the, the, the growth of, of, of usage in these indications. But again, you know, I think the fact that PID, you know, the increasing recognition and increasing diagnosis rates and, and secondary immunodeficiencies um, you know, coming to the forefront as well, I think we set uh, for continued growth uh, in the demand uh, for immunoglobulin uh, in, in the years to come. And that uh, just further, um, I, I guess, highlights the need uh, for a better approach to, to plasma collection on a worldwide, um, you know, scale and for a more balanced approach like we've been, um, you know, discussing during, during the whole session. So I think for me, um, my conclusion is that I, I don't think uh, we're going to see a change in the trend. Uh, what, we, what will be interesting to see uh, is how, uh, you know, the fact that obviously uh, the hemophilia community and, and certainly well in the US and in, in Europe, but Mark uh, and Val, you may correct me there, but I think 
ob obviously recombinant therapies, um, you know, gene therapy, uh, you know, monoclonal antibodies have, have been, uh, you know, new ways of, of treating hemophilia. And there's a, you know, the, the uh, reliance on, uh, on, on, on plasmatic uh, coagulation factors has obviously decreased. Now, when I started my career, uh, you know, some 20 years ago, we were always talking about the fact that you needed to have, you know, to sell at least four fractions to make this uh, industry viable, to make sure that uh, uh, you, you can continue to produce the, the, the therapies. And what I'm wondering is where we will be by the beginning of the next decade, you know, uh, will it just be immunoglobulin, you know, driving the whole field? And what does that mean? Uh, uh, what are the, um, you know, consequences uh, about that, if that is a scenario in terms of, you know, pricing, and if you talk about pricing and increased prices, you immediately will talk about access again. So, you know, what will be the access challenges will be facing when it comes to accessing immunoglobulin therapies in, in 10 years from now. I think these are very interesting discussions. We've mentioned the role of albumin, which continues to be important. Um, you know, the other question is also where will that be in, in 10 years from now? And I, I don't have the answer to that, but I think these are the sort of questions that we need to keep in mind moving forward as we monitor, uh, you know, the continued evolution of this, uh, of this field. So thank you, Johan. I think you've rightly focused us uh, on the future and the increase in growing demand, growing demand. Just to take us back to a comment Val made, um, von Willebrand disease is the most common bleeding disorder in the world, and the alternatives are quite limited for treatment of von Willebrand disease. And with the recent recommendations of prophylaxis uh, for individuals with von Willebrand disease, uh, I would expect that the bleeding disorders community is going to have a, a, an interest in uh, plasma therapies for the, uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, Peter? Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. Um, <clears throat> I think Johan covered many of the issues that I think are important to highlight and to end on. I wanted to add that, um, as you mentioned earlier, Mark, there are certain parts of the world that are not using plasma therapies as, uh, as frequently as some of the other parts. I think looking forward into the future, you will see increased demand from current indications from the parts of the world that are currently low and middle income countries. And as they improve their, their healthcare systems, um, as they become wealthier, they too will begin to uh, try to access um, plasma therapies. So I think that has the potential to increase demand and I think fairly significantly as well. There's also, and I realize that um, people have hoped for this for a long time, but nevertheless, there is also the possibility that a plasma therapy may, um, may turn out to be effective against a non-rare indication, um, against a non-rare ailment. If that were to happen, that would also spike the, the, um, um, the demand as well. We are seeing improvements in diagnoses as well. So again, looking forward into the future, at least over the next decade, uh, maybe more, I don't see a decrease in demand anytime soon. And if anything, I see more and, and faster increases in demand over the next 10 to 12 years, and then looking forward into the future further beyond that, I'm not sure. The one last thing that I wanted to cover is to talk a little bit about plasma donors um, and the stigma that surrounds people who sell their plasma regularly. And I think a message that matters to the patient community, we talked about how it's important that actually the patients drive the discussion, both I think at the policy level, but also more culturally. And with respect to the climate um, that surrounds people who sell their plasma. I go on Twitter on a basically daily basis and I do a search for quote unquote paid plasma. And every time there is somebody who announces on Twitter that they are going to sell their plasma, I always reach out to them and, and I say, thank you, right? I say, uh, I like to say on behalf of the Canadians that benefit from the Americans that sell their plasma, I wanna say thank you on behalf of Canada to you for helping. So I, I take the time to say thank you as often as I can. And I know that there are all kinds of programs and projects in place to thank plasma donors, but I do think it's important to do the best we can to express that gratitude to the people who do this and thereby create medicines that 
you know, not only improve lives, but in many cases, save lives as well. Um, thank you, Peter. That's a great message. I think too often we forget to say thank you, and it, and it means a lot. Val, uh, we'll let you uh, sort of wrap this up for us. Closing thoughts, things that we didn't touch on that you would like to share. Um, any other final words? Um, I think um, <laughs> some of the, I, I'm a little uh, alarmed to look into the future that there's going to be more uses for plasma and there's going to be a shortage. Um, something to think about is, you know, if you need a liver, uh, you have to qualify for a liver. Uh, you can't just get one. You can't just get on a list and get one. So look forward to the future that if there's a shortage for plasma, we're going to have to make some hard decisions about who gets access to plasma. And that's a discussion none of us want to have. Um, you know, we want to increase the donation rate because we don't want to have to make those decisions. The patients who live with lifelong chronic illnesses, should we have to make hard decisions, are going to be at the forefront of getting those products, but it's going to make um, the uh, access to it even more um, a big, bigger shortage. Uh, all those one might say, well, I've got a lifelong disease, maybe I should get it. Um, but at the same time, we know that's gonna hurt a lot of people. So as you talk about the future and a shortage, um, keep in the back of your mind that at some point we're gonna have to make some hard decisions unless we address the shortage issue. I'd also, um, one of the things uh, you were saying, Peter, that uh, struck me, um, I do think patient that people who donate should be thanked. I think when people use cell, that it hits a particular button with people. Um, so donate, you know, in, I don't know how we say it, but um, cell hit me as somewhat of an alarm for those who don't want compensation, you know, want compensation for plasma. So just keep in mind the messages that we're sending as well. Um, and um, keep in mind what kind of marketing plan we can set up that hits all the social media and that I, I've never seen a, a plasma collection um, commercial on TV. I've just never seen one. <laughs> so uh, that might be something to encourage the industry to develop to, that will help our costs. So those would be my closing comments. Well, I want to thank uh, I want to thank our three panelists. I want to thank Peter, um, Johan, and Val. Uh, I think it's been a great discussion. Obviously, we could have talked about this uh, much longer. I think the, there are some great takeaways that uh, clearly there are great minds that are working on this. I've been stimulated by being with all of you today. Uh, our work is not done. There is an enormous demand. Uh, while maybe there is a headwind on some of our issues, uh, I think we have a lot of traction on issues that are important to us. And given the resilience of this community, I expect that we will continue to push forward, but it will take the collective input. So. Thanks to the audience. I wish you well for the balance of your conference and, uh, and hopefully we will all uh, be together in person at some point soon. Thank you, good day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.